Hello everyone, my name is Def Camp and welcome to Def Talk, the talk show that focuses on everything World of Warcraft, whether it's retail, classic, or the players that play it, we're going to cover it all. We have with us, of course, my brother Meldron. How you doing, Meldron? Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. And a very, very special guest today. So we have someone who was a dungeon developer for the World of Warcraft in the heydays of Vanilla. His name is John Stats. How you doing, John? Hi, Death Camp. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Doing absolutely wonderful today. I think I feel like a little girl who's just uh, met Justin Bieber. So. Do you feel like that <laughs> all the time? <laughs> no, 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 just, oh. Just, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> he may feel like that all the time. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... I just wanted to start off and say we, we really appreciate you coming out. I wanted to start off just by uh, getting a little bit to know you and uh, how you started into uh, gaming in general. So uh, why don't you take us off? Yeah, well, so I was uh, – it's funny. I was in the PC Gamer uh, back in New York. Um, uh, I was in advertising, and that meant I was a Macintosh person. And – when my my friends, my roommates were PC, I'd play games on their PC, but I was always Mac. So I really didn't have much of a choice for games. Kind of sucked. Yeah. Uh, and then I saw one of them building uh, 3D levels uh, on, uh, they call it scoopware. They, t- they take a CD and they scoop up a bunch of tools and resources off of the internet, and then they sell it at CompUSA. And I saw them building 3D levels. I said, what are you doing? Because the implication was that he was a dungeon master and his master in you know grade school, uh, since grade school, and the idea of building one of our own dungeons and walking around with him blew my mind. I bought a PC the very next day, like literally in the morning. I was opening doors, bought the most expensive computer I could find, and just went straight into uh, uh, level design with uh, Quake editors. Wow. So let me get this straight. You had no previous gaming experience at all before this? Oh, well, on um, – okay. I mean it was Civilization. Uh, I I played a lot on my, my, my roommate's uh, PCs, a lot. Okay. okay. Uh, but like through college and everything, my college was uh, – I went through a really tough graphic design program. It had like 75% dropout rate. So it was all like super, okay. super like, like okay. a boot camp type of thing. You can get used to like 80, 90 hour weeks, no time for gaming or partying or anything like that. So once I moved to New York and met some, uh, some of my friends uh, uh, who were all gamers. And, but I was like, you know, Magic the Gathering. I was one of mm-hmm. New York. For one year, uh, I was a New York City champion for one year. Um, I was oh, in wow. the tri-state area. Uh, very competitive. I got to competitive level of uh, Quake. I don't know what they call it, like the octafinals or whatever, when there's like 16 people left in the PGL. But I that was my pinnacle, getting to the top 16 in a uh, an organized uh, tournament. There's like I don't know, thousands of dollars or something like that for grand prize. But they whooped my butt. But that was uh, <laughs> yeah. I could either be a good uh, shooter player. I'm still very very good at shooters. Uh, but um, at least computer games anymore. I have an issue with my hands, so I can't play Fortnite. I can't play Overwatch. All these awesome games. But uh, yeah, I uh, I would love to uh, love to play those games. So, uh, but no, I started level editing and uh, just as a hobby at home, and I did that for like four and a half years, like oh, wow. really, really hardcore. I had uh, some stints where I'd, I'd take off work. I was an independent contractor for a lot of uh, uh, advertising uh, firms, just Madison Avenue all the way, you know, and I would take off like the largest uh, run was like eight months. And I was way over, uh, well, s- significantly over a hundred hours a week, just in my room, just working nonstop. I was chugging a slim fast. As my, <laughs> nice. I had a lot of, I had a lot of medical issues <laughs> after <laughs> doing that only like just, Oh, it was, it was like, Oh, it was a weird time in my life. So yeah. After that, 
Yeah, you you work on a mod group, and there's people do tutorials and stuff like that. You know, same same stuff as they have. You know, uh, Unreal and a lot of uh, cool mm -hmm. engines are available right now, and there's tutorials for everything online. And I was just kind of the first wave of the 3D uh, editing guys. Wow. And I ended up with a portfolio. And I mean, that wasn't the goal. And it took many years, many years of making awful, awful, awful levels. Uh, I was, I think I told, I can't remember who I told. I had the Malcolm uh, Gladwell uh, 10,000 10, hours before I even went to Blizzard. So I had my, Jeez. I had been, you know, I knew what I was doing by the time I got to Blizzard, which right. is oddly weird because level design for a while was a lot easier than doing for a first-person shooter, right. especially for a multiplayer map, uh, because they're very inflexible levels. You can't just mm. size them up or change them. And yeah, BSP editors were pretty rough, pretty slow going. Mm. And uh, But yeah, that's, that's how I got into... Uh, to, to, to blizzard just super 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 polished levels yeah so wow. i was going to ask that so you <clears throat> you create this portfolio and i'm sorry if i'm going yeah. from a different land i'm, I'm in sure. academia and so the way that we get jobs is we we we, we do experiments we, we write papers um right. and that papers are impactful so you coming from a different field uh from in advertising how so the process of first of all how did you find out about the gig and second secondly how did uh I guess for someone who's coming outside of game design, how is that portfolio considered uh, experience in your field? Perhaps. Um, well, it's everything's. First of all, nobody cares where you graduated. Of course, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, like that. That you know, there's no school for. There still isn't a reputable school for game design that I know of. I've actually looked them up, and most of the programs are pretty weird. Hmm. Uh, like they're a subset usually of programming. And, you know, game, game design, I think, is more of an art where mm. you have to try, just get into it and fail and fail and fail. And eventually, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get your, uh, you'll learn your, uh, your, your stripes. But, uh, yeah, I, I was just making levels. And there's just this natural desire to release something that's polished. My first levels, I was releasing terrible, terrible levels. Oh, my God. But at the end... Uh, I learned to really spend time on what I was working on. Easily 500 hours on a level. Wow. Just, and and I was a freelancer, so I kept track of my time. So <laughs> it's it takes that. I mean, it takes that much thought. If you're going to spend 500 hours just constructing it, you spend also a lot of time designing it and make sure it's uh, good. And so my Quake Three levels were uh, they were pretty tight. There were some I. I I still think that some of my best work is uh, with my Quake 3 stuff. It's really and, cool. And uh, it was up there with uh, the professional stuff that Blizzard had seen. And uh, one of my mod group guys said, hey, John, there's a level design uh, positions available at Blizzard. You should uh, send your stuff. And I said, eh, okay, you know, that's a stable. Sounds like a stable company. You know, they got their act together. They release <laughs> polished stuff. Uh, because I was in a pretty comfy position in, in advertising. I didn't want to, and I was 30 years old at the time. Okay. I didn't want to like, I'd, <laughs> I started in New York making $18,000 a year. So I know how to live cheap, you Jesus. know, and, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah. So then I got, uh, went to Blizzard, took a huge pay cut. You guys, uh, I've went from 80 grand to 50 grand. It was nice. wow. And you're moving to California. I mean, New York and California. In Orange County. But... In Orange yeah. County. Yeah, yeah. Orange that's, County. Yeah, that's still. Yeah. yeah. And and the thing is, is that it's 50 grand is still pretty good. Like you can still get by on 50 grand, certainly, and uh, even in Orange County. But you're not buying a house. You're certainly not right. supporting the family on that. Right. Uh, but the thing is, is that um, I didn't care. You know, I didn't have a house. I didn't have a, you know, desire to start a family or anything. I was just in it for the uh, – for the juice but um so was this uh, like your dream job to go to basically or was this uh, uh, more of yeah something? i mean yeah. i just had a gut check it's like john you know if you're spending this much time doing levels maybe this is what i ought to because i was at i was really i was set up in new york i mean i was a department lead i was 30 years old which is not an easy get i mean yeah. new york is a very yeah. competitive especially uh, i was in pharmaceutical advertising totally corporate wow you know yeah. but uh i uh 
I knew where my passion was. And I said, you know what? I can always go back to advertising if I, I need to, or right. uh, graphic design, which is, you know, my concentration was, but, uh, yeah. And, uh, even though the salary at Blizzard, I didn't know this, but 50 grand is like less than half of what other 3d level designers earn at the time. At the time. Were, oh um, yeah. Like star Wars galaxies. Those guys were pulling in from what I hear 120 grand. Okay. <laughs> And the reason why it was so low is because Blizzard was comparing 3D level design salaries to the salaries that they would hire for their Warcraft 3 and Starcraft projects. For an, for an RTS. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and which is basically dropping and dragging uh, uh, already yeah. existing yeah, I mean, assets. I've, even I've messed around with Starcraft map editors. I mean. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it's, <laughs> and, and, you know, scripting is something anyone can eventually learn. I'm oddly enough, you know, not. I, I, I don't know. It's, they're, they're two different things. One's 3D level designer. It's, it's, it's a much rarer thing to get someone who is good at art, is good at gameplay, is, you know, into the game, you know. So uh, I was willing. That's, that's why I got the job. I, I was willing to work. So what were your first impressions uh, when you got to Blizzard? Uh, yeah, I, it's one of my favorite quotes from the book is that it was kind of, uh, reminded me of my, uh, I have an uncle who sells saw blades in Akron, Ohio. That's where I'm from. That's where I am now, Akron, Ohio. And, uh, he had a little sales company, Akron, Ohio, and he would just, just, uh, he would joke about how some companies, as soon as they get some money, they get a big expensive, uh, consequence conference room table a big expensive this or that and they and he's is just an always in the mode of saving for leaner times and that's what blizzards they were very frugal okay and i respected that you time know, is that's, money that's friend. what i was from yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now which is funny because i was coming from new york city where you walk in a lobby of a 50 story uh i mean it's just you know, cherry wood, 20 foot tall, you know, walls, just crazy, gorgeous right. furniture, everything. Uh, but going into Blizzard, it was, it was kind of folksy. It was, it was there, there was about 200 people there. And it was kind of like, I described it in the book. It was de decorated like somebody's basement. It was yeah. pretty, like if, if they didn't have props from trade shows like E3, there'd be no decorations whatsoever uh, on the walls. Like, I mean, that's, that's, if you go to a game company and you see the big sign, like uh, what of, the, of their product or their company, guarantee you it was made for a trade show like E3. And then they said, well, we have this thing, we pay for it. Let's hang it in the office. That's the only, you know, reason why anybody spends <laughs> money on that type of stuff. We've got the statues from the all the E3s all around, you know, the Blizzard campus now. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's pretty crazy there. Yeah. So, like, did you notice a sense of immediate sense of family or a guild feeling when you when you moved in, when you when you moved across country, started working at this place? Yeah, um, they were really, really, uh, they were very uh, welcoming. It was kind of weird how welcoming they were. It wasn't just like, oh, uh, I think I got a little bit of a better welcome than anyone else because Blizzard apparently had a really, really hard time hiring anybody, uh, especially at the salary. So they got me and they were, oh boy, now the dungeons are going to move forward. Okay, so... They had these very high expectations and we were just, I was building levels out of Quake 3 editors. That's what it was. And when we would look at a dungeon, we would load up Quake 3 as if, as if it were a <laughs> multiplayer map. We'd walk around a cave. We had a couple caves, couple mines, and we would just see what the technology, what BSP. BSP is like big, basically instead of building stuff with a wireframe model type of uh, this smooth wireframe type of tube, which is what uh, the modern editors use. It was more like building blocks. That's what BSPs are. I forget uh, what the what the uh, anagram is for, but um, it's like imagining uh, imagine a bunch of Lego pieces that when you compile the level, they all fuse together in a continuous uh, stream, but you can't resize them. There's prone to error, so many errors. Uh, there's it's it was just a very clunky technology wow. interesting so did they like in your first day say all right john you're the non-instance cave guy and you're <laughs> going to work on 
these no. specific dungeons? How did that work out? How did you? They had they. They had no idea. They, I, I, during my interview, I could tell they were pumping me for information, which was mm-hmm. which was kind of funny because, like, <laughs> how would you go around building, say, this or that? And I was like, okay, yeah, you know, they're fishing for information, which was fine. That's a fair <laughs> game. And uh, um, they uh, they said, well, what do you think we should start on? They had never worked. You have to understand, this is in 2000. No one had, had built anything in 3d in fact one of my quotes from the book is uh colin murray one of the lead uh, uh, senior gameplay uh, programmers he said the worst game a company makes is their first 3d game and <laughs> that it, that imbr- that what that it's a commentary of uh the difficulty in trying to apply what you've learned from 2d games to 3d games you have like 18 months go by and you have useless tools. You have useless assets you've learned because, and that those are expensive months. I mean, that's a lot of time. That broke a lot of studios and a lot of people were just forced to push stuff out of the, the door when they lost uh, tons of time translating. Well, 3d games also take way longer than 2d games and no one knew about this at the time. Right. So uh, the programmers were new to three, uh, you know, uh, uh, 3D, the, the artists were, the, I mean, it was just, uh, you had heart, just the camera, just where what happens to the camera in 3D space was something right. that a lot of 2D games didn't have to consider. And uh, the video cards, there were so many video cards that you had to support at the time. Um, so many uh, versions of each video card and it was so much easier to do a console. Like console games were 3D because they only had one video card. They didn't have to dedicate a, a, a programmer to just translate everything to every single type of video card, make sure all, you know, there's no artifacts or bugs, uh, which is a huge drain on your uh, your resources when you have to do that. Wow. But uh, no, I they gave me carte blanche and uh, we started building uh, micro dungeons just to see what that looked like and it didn't it was very hard edge hard shadows a lot of black and it was just it was was ugly i mean it was it was quake 3 a few years after quake 3 had launched and external like even compared to like everquest like uh they they have super super low poly uh dungeons and we were hopefully going to do a little bit better than the everquest dungeons like one of their dungeons would have like 400 polys. Like it would be insane. Like, I mean, that's what like one model would have. I mean, super <laughs> low polys. Uh, but um, yeah, you yeah, can definitely so see they, in the work. I'm sorry, you can definitely see in the work you guys put out that it's, it, 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 I mean, for the day, it was extremely high res, extremely well done, uh, I think, in my opinion. I mean, people may look at it now and scoff at their their beat when they're playing BFA, but man, it's it, it's it's pretty well, awesome to, to see. I think it's aged pretty well, honestly. I really do, and I think that's one of the uh, magical things about the art style of WoW. But I also want to say, real quick, guys, the the book that John is referencing is the oh. WoW Diary. So it's a book that <laughs> oh, yeah. Before right, yeah. we were referencing this book, it's if uh, it's you have to about... bring it up, Def Hamp. All right, all right, <laughs> go ahead, talk about it. And it's an inside look through John's eyes. Uh, what it was like working at Blizzard. And um, so the book is going to be out. So, uh, John, if you want to talk about like uh, when, because we're, I have uh, something that I read. It's a little version of the book, but we're looking yeah. at uh, what's the time frame? Can, uh, the book's written. It's everything. Everything is done, just the funding. Uh, right. In four, four days, well, from where we're recording this, August 28th. Uh, August 28th is when my Kickstarter launches. Um, we're, uh, yeah, we've got eBooks, PDFs, and uh, the hard copies. Uh, I also have this, uh, the Mac Daddy signed edition um, that oh, comes in a case and some uh, promotional uh, articles printed. The, I, the, there's, there's a bunch of articles coming out on uh, Wowhead uh, about it's material I didn't put into the book because the book is already 360 pages long. It 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 start it starts it's a long book. 18 rounds of edits. Okay. Now a lot of that was just because this was my first book, but with each round, 
I, I, I just crammed more and more <laughs> uh, little minutia, uh, uh, anecdotes, uh, stories. Every little idea I had go, oh, where could I fit that in? <laughs> oh, I was talking about the art director. Okay, I can fit that in. And then I'd have to, you know, shoehorn it into the page. Like some pages are, you know, like uh, just, just, just crammed with stuff. And, you know, I have to read stuff like that. So, uh, um, yeah, so it's coming out August 28th. Um, and, yeah, that should be cool. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, we have a, we'll have a link in the description to the Kickstarter page. So in August 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, U.S. time, guys, uh, head on over there and support John. We'll, we'll go over more, way more of it, but I just wanted to bring that out. Yeah, we'll talk about it at the end to. of the, sure. at the interview as well. Right. Um, so definitely. And he has some other things he wants to talk about, too, including a Wowhead uh, article. So – um, going back to what I'm really interested in, and I think maybe a lot of other listeners are interested in, can you make perhaps briefly, but I, I don't think it's going to be possible and that's fine. Go as long as you want. How does the creation of a dungeon from start to finish, who does it go through? Does it go to you first? Does it go to the, does an artist make a sketch? Can you please just kind of elaborate how it goes from an idea to somewhere where we, we run sure. into and yeah. dungeon? Yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, it starts with the world. We look at all the zones and say, all right, how many dungeons do we, do we think we can make? Uh, it was, this this is totally all guesswork. A bunch of guys just improvising as we go and Mets, we tell Mets and okay, we need about 20, 30 that. And he'll basically come up with themes that fit inside his world, um, that are cool. And he'll see how we respond to that. If we fight, you know, we were, we were going to have like a, a old West type of dungeon, uh, in, uh, uh, the Barrens between, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 uh, the Torrin and the orcs, but there was so much content already in the Barrens that we actually dropped the, the, uh, the horde over to have, uh, a, a, a new dungeon. I, I forget where we went. Um, I guess we all went to the dead mines or the, Oh no, we have the whaling caverns. Okay. Yeah. Whaling caverns is yeah. the kind of, yeah. I guess, dead mine I equivalent. Yeah. Right. Then you have I built the, okay. that, yeah. Originally that <laughs> was going to, that was going to be the orc dungeon. And then the Torrin were going to have their own dungeon. It was going to be like a, uh, a, a cowboys and Indians type of thing. Cause the cor Torrin were very like, uh, Native Native American, Native yeah. American. Yeah. Yeah. So met some basic with the plan and, uh, the game designers will say, okay, this would be kind of a cool for a raid dungeon. Uh, this, uh, this sounds more epic. Like, let's push us around it. We would see where we could fit them in the zones. The zones were, you know, being massaged on a daily basis, like what uh, new areas and stuff uh, where things fit. Uh, then have a concept meeting. When, when, when a dungeon designer was ready, we would have a concept meeting. And that would be uh, Chris Metzen. A level designer, uh, maybe a game designer, the uh, uh, question and a producer to make sure everything's, you know, copacetic with the schedule. And he would, Metzen would give a real quick download as fast as possible. Uh, and like I, I use the deadlines in my book. Um, I have a section called the growing pains of the uh, Whaling Caverns, <laughs> which is a dungeon just got bigger and bigger and bigger as development went on. And, and uh, the concept was he, he'd say Isle of Dread, right? Isle of Dread was an old Dungeons and Dragons module. Dinosaurs running around, oh. you know, they're, they're kind of uh, tribal. They're somewhat uh, uh, ancient. You know, they'll have a couple beads or decorations on them. You can see uh, the Velociraptors kind of have some type of tribal stuff, you know, attached to them. So they're still... Uh, and the the concept was that someone's uh, dreamy uh, creatures uh, that shouldn't be around. I think that's what it was. And he'd say, "Do you get it?" And I'd say, "Okay, we got a natural cave." I grew up going on cave tours out in the Midwest, so uh, there's a lot of caves that I just wanted to make a convincing cave. So I was mm. like, "Totally, I get it," you know, and. It's kind of funny. Dungeons would often be defined by what monsters were available. Mm -hmm. We would say, uh, you know, we've seen so many uh, 
uh, kobolds or gnolls by that point, you know, let's go with, you know, keep it bestial, you know, and, you know, Metz will go, okay, yeah, that, that works for this. And he, his goal was to get out of the meeting as fast as possible. Like I've seen him in for five minutes at a time. What, once I could tell him, give him thumbs up. I got it. He'd say, okay, are we good? And maybe the, uh, the, the dungeon scripters would always want to know what, what the names were or what the, 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 the sub bosses were. And that was always a pain in the ass for him. Cause he was like, we're never really ready. He just, he, <laughs> you know, it's just, just fucking size something up. That, 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 that's your, you know, yeah. and they'd go, okay. So I think that's how we ended up with it. We have a giant Murloc still in uh, the Wailing Yeah, Caverns. The Wailing Caverns is a Murloc. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just because we'd seen so many of the same dinosaurs over and over that 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 instance was so we wanted to do something different because it's such a chore to get there uh, at least one of the wings that's right the dreamer was the last the final one mm. but like for that room the very final boss where the uh, monsters are coming out of the water yep. uh he would say straight up crone room in 13th warrior and i'd seen the movie i'd say okay i got it you know the roots hanging hanging down you know type of you know creepy almost like nightmarish type of feel i can do that so and i just made you know a cave that was kind of creepy looking uh and yeah that's that's how it goes so from now on every time i wipe so, in that room because that room is that fight is actually pretty challenging for low-level players every time i wipe in that room and narrow is where he bring comes down and the guy's sleeping i'll think of you Jeff. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's hysterical that's so, so cool though yeah. listening to the process i mean it's it's amazing like oh metzen's like this figure this guy you gotta like pretty much like okay you know he's gonna tell us this this and that and then i like the idea about and it's one of the uh recurring themes in the book that how you guys work together and how it seems like everyone there was just like these amazing like figures who were just like they know what they're doing they got their shit down yeah. and it just it's amazing how blizzard picked who they picked because I think that's why the game was such a the success that it is. Yeah. The team was just uh, amazing superstars on the team. I mean, at one point I think, Oh geez, I don't want to get this wrong. I think oh, there's me and Eric Dodds and a couple artists. We were sitting around just pontificating what game has better technology, better programmers. Was there any type of project ever been done? And, you know, artists and designers, we don't, we, we know nothing about programming, but we knew that we were doing stuff that uh, wow is incredible. If, if wow was anything, it was a technological achievement. I mean, if, if I had to really pick one because it's the full streaming and that means no load screens. Uh, we the only load screens were when 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 you had to go into a dungeon, which was a server to server transition, or from Azeroth to Kalimdor, which was another server to server transition. But that had never been done before in any game, and the fact that we did that in an MMO is <laughs> insane because the, the 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 limitations on MMOs. Um, I brought up in my book the uh, the bank space. The number of bags that the player has was limited to hardware costs for the server. Wow! Really? They, they, they literally. This was before we had even hired items designers. We had figured out what's the very smallest uh, quest. Uh, what? How? How big is a quest? The answer is I think twenty bytes. Um, Bytes, not kilobytes, but bytes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. The, the smallest, uh, uh, it's probably much bigger by now. I mean, you know, things get bloated, but uh, that was the, the average quest uh, uh, um, space. The items were larger because items themselves had slots and they were a little bit more complicated. But from the uh, database programmers giving us a figure how many bytes a item was, we could as extrapolate, well, if there's a total of eight slots in each character has so many bags and has so many characters, we know how much uh, we need to support per character um, in hardware. And, and 
the hardware is also uh, way more expensive, way, way, way. Like you can never have, you can never lose data on these servers. And so you can't compare like hard drive space that's on your PC to these blades that are in these data centers because the blades can never lose content. I mean, if you, if we lost, even, even if you lose a day, you know, there's a day where somebody killed a super, super rare spawn or they got the drop that was a super rare drop. And if they lose, and when they lose that day, you've lost. Not only have you lost that player, but everyone in that guild has that or lost a good thing. And everyone on the server is, I mean, it just goes out. So wow. that's the one thing you cannot lose. So servers, <laughs> they were very expensive. Interesting. So I think our conception, the player's conception of why the bag spaces were so small is because you guys were being hard asses on us. <laughs> no, no, no. With, with the, they were given that, that figure and our uh, probably the leap. He was the uh, trade skill designer at Hearth's little project. He was the design lead for Hearthstone. So uh, Eric was a good friend of mine. He, uh, uh, once he knows that, okay, each player will have, or each character will have, say, I don't know, 80 items maximum on their character. I'm just picking out something. Then I'll go, okay, this is, you know, he'll get out his little calculators or his, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheet. And he'll figure out roughly how many, you know, and it, it, he would massage things like do large bag feel good you know what feels good like if you're just looting tons and tons and tons of stuff you're throwing away 99 percent of it look stuff off the ground you know it's uh although that was never on the table we couldn't actually do that because one of the mmos is you if you don't know where items drop because an item ever falls it could fall potentially over the edge of something or, or through a uh hillside that clips into the hill and then uh, your 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 mouse clicks on the hill instead of the item and so you can't pick it up or loot it so these were the nuts and bolts where a lot of time was spent and when you, you say like oh yeah, yeah we recorded you, you really appreciated you know uh the developers spending so much time working on their stuff yeah. you're seeing like the very very tip of the iceberg for for what we did but it's still appreciative uh you know we still appreciate the uh you know the thanks <laughs> yeah and thank you for doing what you did so in, interesting uh going back to what we asked about the process um so so everything was basically just in your head and you put it down there was no artist giving you conceptual frameworks about this is what we want whaling caverns to look like it was all john make whaling caverns was it that basically, yeah just an example of whaling caverns yeah. well now, the great thing about concept artists is that it's very fast. They're very good and they're very fast and they're very imaginative. Uh, and we use concept artists on, artists on everything uh, except dungeons. Okay. The, the reason why, I mean, a lot of them would complain that uh, they would complain about having to do concept sketches for a stump, a tree stump. Like they, they couldn't <laughs> believe that. Here, I'm doing a tree stump. Are you serious with this? You want me to do variations of this zone's tree stumps? But getting that stump approved by the art director that when it's built and textured in 3D, then it's not a big risk. You kind of have an idea what it's going to look like. And that's that's what that and if there's changes, it's great to change a sketch. It really sucks to change a textured uh, modeled out object because it takes longer to do. Um, yeah. And there's all kinds of things like you have to model collision for, for it and, you know, some little minor technical stuff. But for dungeons to describe it is getting a screenshot of a dungeon. It doesn't look good. Like screenshots of interior spaces, they never ever look good. You have to always have a, a me uh, like a movie where you're panning mm. your, your your camera around to, to get a sense of 3D space. Uh, concept artists, that it's almost the, re the reverse is true. When you're designing something, when you're drawing a picture, it's hard to draw interior art. The exterior of building they were great for that uh brian morris wrote did the the carazon okay i just i worked from his uh, his sketch we 
we'd rebuilt Carasan so many times that we wanted to get this. We spent we we spent you guys way got too much right, time on the, the concept. Sketch. I love Carasan yeah. is my favorite okay. drink. Like, oh, thank drink. you. I love it. it. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a lot of pain, a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of blood was shed before it's that perfect. thing was uh, uh, done. Perfect. But um, the yeah, Carazon was like they the exteriors were very easy to do. But once you get into a dungeon, like how would you do a concept sketch for uh, even the main cavern? Like you'd like well, how would you even do that? Like a cutaway view would be meaningful. Uh, to a level, level design. Usually what the artists did when they did concepts is they would sketch the uh, the objects in the area, like crates, like uh, they'd get like if it was a nautical theme for at the end of Dead Mines, they would do that. They, they would do a picture of that or not. Um, but like doing a concept sketch of uh, a hallway, unless that hallway is repeated throughout, like the hive never got a concept. They should have. Uh, the, the the hives and the Ankarash are my worst dungeons easily. I'm not I'm not crazy about that. Uh, we we'll, I like. Uh, I mean, they were your first, right? That that was yeah. Uh, that it was, was the, the first one. Yeah. I mean, and they're big. Like you yeah. said, we talked about how a lot of those dungeons were very big. Like Ankarash, the only phase, you know, where you have to have a mount to go through because it's just yeah. a tunnel. It's just oh, so long. It was well. We had no concept of okay, so. Let's talk about our concept of to make it linear or nonlinear. We had no idea Wh which one works better. Had no right. concept of how many people are going to be in a raid. Is it ten people? Is it fifty people? Uh, how many monsters were those uh, groups going to be fighting? If they were, there's always this draw that we were always trying to do something like Diablo where there would be like a, a lot of monsters, not just one big one that you're trying to, to figure out. They, we wanted to make it more action oriented, uh, just to make it, you know, look cooler, like the, like the monsters could work together. They never really, it just wasn't good for the, uh, uh, the MMO, uh, uh, I guess, structure, architecture of an MMO. Gotcha. It's, yeah, just it, what it did is it there was a front load of damage, uh, or you once you'd kill a couple, it would just be a trivial trivial fight later. Or your mechanics there as they die, the ones that live are getting stronger and strong. The fight's significant at all, and that was just way too weird. So they never figured that out. So we didn't know what to do with the camera. I had no idea how high the camera was going to. Be, if it's going to be bumping on the ceiling over how the uh, it was crazy, yeah. Um, there was a number of times where we talked about just dump uh, 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 Ankarash and just starting over because uh, it got lit wrong, uh, the textures were very saturated, so colored lighting had no effect on anything. So it would disorienting. You didn't know which way, like if you accidentally turned around, you wouldn't know because it was just such a busy looking area. Now this is all before we even had the mini map. We had no idea how the mini map was going to work. So for years we're navigating by what we see in front of us. We didn't know, we didn't see the, 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 the tunnel or the room that we were standing and like what inspired me to write the wow everything that i thought i knew about game development was so a hundred percent wrong and i was into it hardcore i i i, I followed the uh, plan updates of the first person shooters uh john carmack and john romero and all the uh the guys from uh, uh i followed level or just all these uh uh eric, eric beisman um all these designers and first person shooters that were we wanted to know how to work, right? And when I got the Blizzard, they do everything differently. They do everything mm. different from a business standpoint, all the way down to the philosophy and how, you know, communicating with fans. They just did everything different. And wow, it was such a mess when I first got to it. it I, I knew it was hard to make a game. I knew that. And, and I didn't quite realize we didn't know how hard it was to make an MMO. We knew it was hard, but we had no idea it was going to be that hard. <laughs> Um, most of the guys that went on to make MMOs after WoW 
just failed utterly, even though they were the leads of craft is because making an MMO is you just cannot underestimate it. And I'm sure the guys doing a wow classic, it's not going to be easy. It's, it's really not going to be easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We will. Uh, uh, I tip my hat to them. They are absolutely, uh, they're, they're trying to take down a very big dragon. Yeah, we will definitely get into that. But I'd like to start a, yeah. a segment, if you will, in the interview, and I want to talk about perhaps the philosophy behind some of your design decisions. Um, <clears throat> so sure. before we jump into like specific examples, I want to talk – well, I will tell the listeners. So John's done 90% of all the non-instance caves, crypts, mines, tunnels, all that kind of stuff. He has a large hand in developing on Carrage, Black Fathom Deeps, all the Black Rock Mountain Dungeons and Raids, uh, Karazhan, Booty Bay, Lock Modan. The Dam, I'm sorry, the Dan of Black Manan, Lower Black Rock Spire, Molten Core, Razorfin Downs, Razorfin Crawl, Skullomance. It goes on. So just to give you an example how much John has been involved in. So let's let's just talk about how do you, as an artist, because you're an artist, how do you bring in the sense that you're trying to make the player feel in your art? So like, as an example, like uh, Razorfin Downs. When you get in there, and it's, for a lot of players, it's the first time you really, really, you really... Uh, or come in contact with the Scourge. So how do you kind of bring that dread of being in Razorfin Downs to the player? Right. So um, it comes with the concept sketch. Um, well, not concept sketch. The concept from Metzen. Uh, the download of – we want this idea of being inside a big thorn bush. That was the concept. And I Definitely visited – Yeah, and – uh, much to the chagrin of the engine programmers, I was um, I was really intent on getting that across. Uh, the canopy of thorns is, I think, when we shipped WoW, the largest object in the game uh, because it's it's just basically a big prop that scales over uh, the players' heads. And well, wait, how wait, where? Where do I even... Every dungeon is different, okay? And every dungeon has its own challenges. Razorfen was a lot of technical challenges. Uh, Razorfen started with that concept of being in a uh, bush, uh, a big thorn bush. Uh, we did have some concepts. Uh, I believe Tom Jung uh, did some awesome giant thorns with, like, scale. And, it, you know, I when, when that stuff sings to me, you know, it's like, oh, okay, okay, I, I get it. Once I get it... Uh, my uh, one of my uh, office mates, Aaron Keller, he uh, do uh, uh, oh, gee, loft objects in 3ds Max, which you can basically project along a spline, a uh, texture, and that's how we made the three-dimensional thorns. Okay, not the canopy, but the the tree trunk-looking stuff. Yes, and that's we didn't actually have to. Usually, when textures are applied, you put uh, down on as a plane, so it's almost like as rays hit a surface that's how the and you get weird stretching but with the loft objects it did everything and so there's a like that allowed me to you know move forward with that but i was inspired mostly by civil war earthworks mm. that i'd seen in uh virginia i'd never seen uh world war ii era and the, the earthworks when you see a wall of Basically, it's grass, okay? That's a wall of grass that is at an 80-degree angle, and it goes up for 20 feet. It's just – it's a weird thing because you, when you think of grass, like, oh, I can climb that. It's grass, you know? And, you know, I'm a kid. I'm going to climb whatever I – and I couldn't get up that thing. And, you know, just – I they had the trenches, the, the old Civil War trench. I believe this was around the Yorktown uh, – Virginia Beach, you know, Virginia Beach area. So I saw this stuff and it just always stuck me that you could do tiers of earthworks. And instead of doing tunnels, separating rooms, the idea of having different plateaus. And that's kind of how I approached, uh, you know, uh, the Razorfin dungeons as like, okay, if, if you're in a, a, a big uh, thorn bush, let's let the pigs dig around in the mud and give them some, uh, uh, some earthwork. So there's like a consistency with their style. And I've always been, I come in from Dungeons and Dragons, uh, where you're building a believable space. That to me is first and foremost, right. 
uh, is that in it, and it just adds to the immersion of the, of, of the player, but like the game, game play, I can't really game play other than just stay out of the way. Don't put stairs in the middle of a, a you know, a combat area. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. So as far as uh, from an art, you're trying to sell the area that, that there's a race of creatures that, that live differently. They live and breathe. And you literally walk through their, in their footsteps. You're going, okay, so this looks like a main thoroughfare. Okay, so we don't want the sleeping line in near here. We'll put them off in the area. And you just model it after a logical city plan or a garrison design or a castle design. I think I've done three term papers on castle design because uh, that's, you know, one, I can regurgitate a term paper for one. But uh, the I was really fascinated with while well, I was in, in D, into D&D at the time. So, uh, you know, that was my wheelhouse. Uh, so as, as long as it looks logical and believable to me, you know, I was concerned, like, where's their source of water? Where's their exits? Does it, does it, cause even though it doesn't have any impact, it sells the space, mm. um, putting, you know, you don't want to put the library right next to the dungeon, you know, things like that. One of my earlier is I minimize hallways. I apply that to my dungeons. There's very few hallways in my dungeons. Now, things like the Wailing Caverns and, you know, on Karash, uh, where it's just all tunnels. That's, you know, that's just the way it goes. But uh, rooms are always going to be more interesting looking. You can do a lot more. Uh, uh, you can show a lot more sense of purpose with a room than a hallway. So just mostly selling the space. And then just as I'm working, you're constantly iterating. When there's two big rooms next to each other, does it make sense to punch a hole through them and let the players on both sides see? And then you're getting like, you're getting bang for your buck. <laughs> you know, you got this parallax of this faraway thing in another room. And so you get cool stuff. I did that a lot with uh, uh, Lower Black Rock Spire and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Wailing Caverns. But uh, yeah, and then, and it's basically as you're working, uh, uh, you're 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 working. Uh, we didn't get a lot of feedback on whether or not they would be good for <laughs> play. Unfortunately, <laughs> till the tail end of the project, then we learned okay, these are these dungeons are too big, you know. So it's kind of like that. Interesting. So did you build the spiral in uh, Razorfin Downs, the one that you actually had to fight your way all the way up and kill the last boss? Oh yeah, I yeah. love that. That place is uh, just oh, that good. is like the, the centerpiece for me. That's the centerpiece for that place. That really? Place. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thanks. It's a uh, cool area. Yeah, I would have uh, plan little vistas. Like you'd kind of compose. Like if you have a ledge and you're looking over, it'd be nice to like if you're looking at something that's just like if there's a big stump or rock that's blocking your. You kind of move the rock aside to give the player a look at the, you know the overall uh, uh, effect of the room. So, uh, yeah, we, we plan for Grand Vistas many times. <laughs> Speaking of Grand oh. Vistas, um, in Black Rock Depths, you, when you're in there, okay, you really feel like you're in the, the Dark Irons city. And it's like an Iron Forge yeah, the Dark Irons. It's like forge. subterranean, yeah. and the, your use of window space, and I think you've alluded to this in kind of the classics, so you can like be in a room, and there's a, there's a certain room I'm thinking of, where you're you're fighting these dark iron dwarves and they have like these like gunnery areas or whatever and then you look out a window and you can see the entire city in the lava beneath stuff like that is like yeah. I don't want the I don't, I don't want to pull the next mob because I want to just sit there and look at it for a second like can you kind of just elaborate how you I, yeah. I know I know I know BRD is your favorite uh, the Black Rock Mountain complex is your favorite but like how did yeah. you get into that whole like mindset of just creating that space um, well, luckily I had a lot of, it was, it's just a nice way to mix when you have Iron Forge, Iron Forge, Iron Forge had been built by that time. So I had a lot of uh, uh, art to start, start with. We would take the models and uh, we would just reapply a dark iron dwarf texture on them a lot of the times. And that's how we would achieve the cities. And when you're underground and you have lava, first of all, lava gives you the big cool lighting, uh, the underneath lighting. It's always good to have a, a lighting source that's natural. Um, Cause then like the Wailing Caverns, it's 
like where's the light coming from that was always a bugaboo of mine and everybody else on the team says john just let it go <laughs> you're not going to have a campfire that's going to let about <laughs> you know light a whole cavern you know we don't want a whole bunch of campfires in the whole whaling caverns so you know i learned to let that one go um but um yeah it, it was just I think that was my first chance uh, building architecture. I'd done, let's say I'd done Booty Bay um, before that. But as far as a dungeon, I'd done Wailing Caverns, on Karash, uh, probably some micros. I think I'd even done Black, no, I think maybe I did Black Fathom Deeps after. But it was my first chance to really get into architecture uh, and showing like just, I'd, I'd also seen Ironforge, so I was, you know, I had crib notes from uh, Aaron Keller, who built Ironforge, so I had the style, um, but it was just a nice mix. There's a lot of lore. Um, sometimes, like uh, Black Fathom Deeps, there really isn't very much cool lore. There's there, there, there's not a lot to go, and there's, there's not a lot of um, archetypes or uh, just memes that you really identify with uh, Black Fathom uh, Deeps as being like, you know, Grecian temples underground uh, and there's roots. It's just, it's kind of inelegant, you know, but like dwarves delving where they shouldn't have been. Well, I mean, that that's just such a, you know, common uh, trope. Yeah, from like there was Lord a of the Rings lot universe. Of stuff. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff to uh, draw from. They've dug too so. deep. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's just fertile. And, and frankly, uh, the whole thing, what, what, Black uh, uh, Black Rock Depths, uh, the lavas, uh, the lava golems, uh, um, the, the, then they have some iron golems. Um, just that gives me three workshops. Okay, you know, the, the as you're going in, I show the process of starting with these big roll on these things. Uh, that I had taken from an art history uh, book from, uh, you know, artists speculating on how they moved these big blocks, <laughs> which I think we know now that's not how they moved them. But it was a cool concept <laughs> to have this this rolling block uh, on this uh, uh, cart. But we, I, I, that just, I mean, there's just a lot of concepts to work with and uh, uh, a lot of textures to work yeah. with too. And there were just such gorgeous textures uh on Karash, i think had like 13 or, or 15 wow. or something wow. and that's a huge difference i kind of worn up my welcome in asking for more textures for uh on Karash, <laughs> but uh they just kind of stopped you know okay yeah 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 we'll get to it yet and they just didn't want to do it it was it's it was just mostly an uninspiring uh dungeon you, you did um, an amazing job with what you had though i really believe but um, i gotta I, I i do i gotta say though for my favorite dungeon, I mean, in pretty much all of WoW, I love Black Rock Depths because it's it's a city, right? You're, you're going, yeah. you go into this dungeon, right? And yeah. I gotta say, one of the most epic moments for me is when you go over the bridge uh, to Lord Lord Insidious, and, yeah. then, and then below you is the lava. Oh yeah, you know, that was gonna uh, be the final boss room. You realize? Really? That was. The original boss room, I wanted that to be the original boss room because he's over molten core, right? Right, exactly. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the game designer said, well, we discovered that uh, you could just drop down and hit the, the end boss really fast. <laughs> and that was kind of – that was a nonlinear dungeon, which mm -hmm. was also – I was so proud of, you know, yeah. work that there's just a lot of ways. It was, it's almost like a playground. You know, there's yep. just – you just go which way you want to go. And it just felt more natural and less like, you know, a straight hallway with yeah. a big round room. Like a kind of just – it's not as inspiring to me. You don't feel like you're sneaking into a living, breathing uh, city, you know, yeah. as much. So, the you know, the – they said it's not long enough. So they tell me this at the very end. And then I built three uninspiring rooms. I usually don't like uh, two mirror rooms so that it's identical in one way. Or uh, even though it's easier to build that, that way, it's 
I don't know. There, it's just a very cheap way to build. Uh, I had built three ceremonial type of rooms, processions to the uh, the throne room, and it doesn't even make sense that they're connected to this lava cavern, uh, which is kind of annoying. Uh, it's the only un, but it was tacked on. It was literally tacked on. And then when I built the Lyceum, which was all these, there's there's just a field of pillars. I just had no concept. I was just literally out of concepts. The game designers loved it. They loved it, loved it, loved it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. It's perfect. And it was yeah, like such the a room vast that I area. Was, well, you talk about I was, the, I was the one we get to get the torch. Yeah, right? it's well, yeah. That, that I wanted to ask you: Were you inspired by Lord of the Rings at all for that one? You know, um, the, uh... no. Uh, that one was just I. I had no idea what to do. Like literally, there was no concept. I was, I'd built. Upper, uh, upper Black Rock Spire, Lower Black Rock Spire, Black Rock Mountain. Uh, I'd also done uh, at that point Black Wings Lair, at least half of it. Um, those rooms aren't that interesting either. Um, there are a couple, and then I did Black Rock Depths. I was out of ideas with this texture set. I'd, when, when you're working on the same texture set for like a year and a half, to just tack something on, I. I, I wanted to work on the next thing. <laughs> so I just built these things real fast and the de game designers loved it. So you never can we tell. We love it too. <laughs> yeah, B really BRD do, is, yeah. Is, is, is an amazing. So there's one more place. I keep talking about BRD. There's a part where you're on like these multiple platforms. You come, it's before you fight that like serpent guy. And there's like these platforms that you can look down and you can fall off, I believe. And you look yeah. down and it's yeah. like there's the city underneath it. And that part is like, awesome as well oh yeah yeah that, yeah well what i did is i just that 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 stuff is so easy to do like you just stick a whole bunch of buildings into a flat plane of rock and then you curve it around and then you do do the same thing again and you curve it around the other way and then you have this city this ring yeah it gives you such a like wow this is a city, you know, I didn't want to, I wanted to convey that this is a huge city that you're in, that you're just in this little part. And so I wanted to very efficiently go the, the scale of this thing, you know, at least try to get up to iron forge. Uh, and, and, and I think you surpassed it. Here. I think it looks larger than iron forge. I think it feels larger because you can't mount in there. You know, you don't have a mount. It's a yeah. circular, um, you know, structure to it. But in BRD, when you're there, you know you're you're, you're you got to fight through the mobs. You you, know, you get to the uh, arena, and then you get to the uh, the bar. You know, which is one of my favorite spots with everyone's drinking. Oh yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. I, I just I get so I get like the chills even when I, I love it so much. And that that it's funny that you mentioned the bar. Pat Nagel, one of the quest designers, spent a lot of time there. He had a lot of fun with that uh, with that space. But uh, yeah, like he sees a room and he does something completely different. He did the same thing with the uh, the rookery in uh, Upper Black Rock Spire. He just put put a whole bunch of uh, eggs. You know, yeah. no one had the idea of tons and tons and tons of ads as a mechanic. A whole bunch of eggs where you know the uh, uh, Leroy Jensen Jenkins video. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Happened, Leroy. But, uh, uh, so, yep. so if we can jump to, I know you, I need you, Black Fathom uh, doesn't have the lore behind it, but however, I have to ask a question: Were you responsible for making that little jump part in the in the beginning where you can fall into the water? So there's like these raised platforms, and you like swim across <laughs> the water, and then you have to jump across the platforms to get to the next part. Did you did you build that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought, well, there's a way you could. Eat. Well, I wanted like a mini game for pe people. That yeah, yeah. To, to see if they could do uh, <laughs> we did it once in whaling caverns where there's a jump make and uh when people have bad internet connections uh it's a lot less fun for them to do that so we didn't do a lot of jumping games we did it in uh, lower black rock spire uh we where, where as soon as you turn left from the uh, or turn right from the instance you could drop down and just take a shortcut halfway through a uh, lower black rock spire right. and it was added uh, people were getting onto the balcony instead of running up to the entrance of Upper Black Rock Spire. Jeff Kaplan, he was actually uh, 
he, he made the request to make move the rocks closer so that Torrens could make the jump because it was a, <laughs> they had a higher uh, uh, collision box, larger collision box than anyone else. And they had a harder time making that jump. So uh, little things like that. And I never planned for people that that's the way. But by the time I was in Upper Black Rock Spire, I was like, yeah, this is the way I don't want to run past this stupid Exactly. Box, yeah. You know, with the slow poison on them. Come oh, on. it's horrible. Yeah. So slow. But that little jump. That, was... <laughs> that little jump in Black Fathom, even with good internet, Melbron can't make it anyway. So he, he <laughs> messes it up every time. No, that, <laughs> that's another thing I'll think of you every time. Every time I fall in that water, I'm like, damn you, John. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so let's go into. So you did Warsong Gulch as well. Um, can yeah. you kind of talk about so that transition where you have a horde to alliance and you the actual tiles of the map transition and it's a beautiful you know uh, transition between like this horde uh, deforestation into this beautiful wilderness that the night elves are trying to keep uh, and and then the actual buildings the bases if you will can you maybe elaborate how how right. you built that. Okay, so you touched upon one of the articles that's coming out on Wowhead on how Warsong Gulch happened, nice. uh, but we'll uh, we'll throw some spoilers out there. Um, <laughs> that was uh, an ex- actually the exterior was made by one of the artists, uh, Matt Malizia. He's uh, I think he's the uh, project director on uh, Frostkeep Studios Rend right now. Mm. Um, Matt's. Matt is a dinosaur when it comes to arts. He jokes and just, oh my gosh. Technically, he is just, he made so many uh, props for the team. Uh, he's a very enthusiastic person. I saw him building just a small PvP area. Mm-hmm. I just saw him because he and I were the only ones working late at night. And we, we would just say hi, you know, at 10 o'clock, we'd go over and see what, what each other's working on. And he was pro- he was working on a bunch of props for Moradon, um, which uh, needed a lot of props. There was not a lot of uh, uh, it was one of the t- texture guys actually built it, and so it was his first dungeon, and it needed a lot of help. <laughs> it needed a lot of help with uh, uh, props and stuff. So that I'd go over there and just see what new cool toys. He would be working on it. He'd he'd be happy to show. But he was working on a PvP zone. And cool. Uh, that is neat. Do you need help with WMOs? And the world map objects were uh, what we would, that's a dungeon, basically dungeon geometry architecture. And he said, sure. And I had, um, before coming to Blizzard, I had four and a half years of experience with capture the flag maps. And so I just translated one of my Quake 2 maps, which I had translated to Quake 3, and I translated it to WoW uh, as bases for a captured flag level. And we were just jamming away. We were completely like working on, uh, no one knew what we were either. It was just goofing around. Um, but uh, yeah, and... So I can't speak to the exterior stuff. I mean, he's a uh, he. He just picked up the WoW tools and learned how to use them and uh, uh, made the air, uh, the area himself. Uh, but the two buildings, they had to have the exact same footprint, so that was a pain in the ass mm-hmm. because orcs build very differently square building that the orcs have, uh, which was just hard. It was it was not. It was kind of outside the. Uh, yeah, it was. Night elves, they have the long, thin buildings. They were just, we were do. it was a square peg situation. Uh, so I'm the buildings as, you know, as, a, you know, artistically, but uh, yeah, who's was just trying to use the same footprint, same geometry for two different art styles. And because uh, we didn't know how symmetrical the maps would have to be. So we guessed, let's just play it safe. We're going to try to sell it to the game designers. Let's eliminate that problem. So oh, that's all else to do. But uh, Cool. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, another place. So there's two places that I'd like to talk about that are not dungeony. And one of them is Booty Bay and the Loch Modan Dam. Um, okay. So Booty Bay, and Def Camp agrees with me, is like, you don't want to leave Booty Bay. It's like one of those places where you're there and it's like, 
man, I want to fish. I want to like, I want to yeah. look at look at that Rio yeah. de Janeiro uh, statue of the of the goblin. Like all these like yeah, um, yeah. really yeah. amazing. How did you so, so this multi tiered kind Mark of almost too. like a a beachy kind of uh, boardwalky yeah. kind of environment? So the word? What, what, yeah, were you, yeah. what'd you say, Def Camp? Sorry. Yeah. I said you really get a sense of like R and R when you're there, like rest and relax. Like yeah. you, you're you're out in Stranglethorn, you're getting ganked. You know what I mean? You, you're, you're all yeah. this yeah. stuff's happening in its space. You know. Well, you're 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 also running the gauntlet to to open up that flight path. You oh, know yeah. the road on down the the thorn where like you're seeing mobs that are like six or seven levels higher than you and there's a big yep. red monkey on the middle of the road and you're like well, what do i do now if i go in the jungle i'm a scared you know <laughs> and you know so you're kind of like just learning how to wow i've never seen a mob that's red before this is like pretty this is pretty i'm pretty close to these things and the, the foliage also made it a, the most claustrophobic so it's my favorite zone i yeah. love uh, just for the fact that the the foliage limits, uh, it, it just there's that uncertainty whether or not yep. there's a, uh, a, a basilisk on the other side of that bush. You know, you just yeah. don't know. And uh, once you get there, you're just like, I don't ever want to leave. I don't <laughs> ever want to go back there. You know, and you can uh, uh, maybe, yeah. I have I have fond memories of these areas too. I mean, I played. Uh, I was probably at one point the highest level uh, raider uh, in, uh, well, probably when we were doing uh, the, uh, oh, geez, Deathwing's Lair. Um, I had gone further than any of the other uh, devs had gone. So that was a, spe- that I enjoyed doing that because then, then I could give feedback or devs could, you know, give. And no one could argue with me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> no, but like Booty Bay was a special place because it was the first zone that it was technically an area where we we were doing something that no one had really ever done before, which is just let our hair down. Let's try to make like a uh, uh, from the Robin Williams Popeye movie. There's Sweet Haven. Uh, there's there, there's a city called Sweet Haven. It's just a ramshackle type of approach. That was kind of maybe one of the uh, the early uh, inspirations. Uh, Monkey Island, straight up. Everyone on the team loved the game Monkey Island. I'd never confessed to them that I'd never played it because uh, it was like an older PC and I was Mac, so no old PC <laughs> games for me. Oh yeah, Monkey Island. Oh yeah, I got you. I got you. I can do this, right? And you know, I didn't know, but I mean, how. How far off could I have been by right, something right. called Monkey Island? You know, Monkey so, Island. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you know. So with the whole Pirates of the Caribbean flair, um, uh, mm-hmm. we got some really strong concept art. Uh, uh, Carlo Aureliano did the uh, shark hanging down from the oh, uh, yeah. the uh, that that was his model. I think that was his first uh, uh, 3D model that he put into a wow. game and. Uh, um, uh, they gave the uh, Tom Jung came up the, uh, with the idea of like a ship being hoisted up in the air and using that as the front of the inn. Um, oh just, wow! Just cool stuff That's, like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, that I had. They knew I was from uh, first person shooter, so they said, "Oh yeah, I can see how John is finally able to do like a full 3D jumping." you know, environment like his quick maps and stuff, you know, like, oh, he's really able to, you know, uh, get off of the 2D plane that you're huh. in most of the game and put level on top of level on top of level and just, and that was fun, but it was just born on the necessity of we're inside this big bowl. Uh, it can't be horizontal. Right. I was also building the transport ship at the time, like I did the Zeppelin and the uh, the, the sailing ship. Uh, and the first sailing ship was like almost bigger than the footprint of Booty Bay <laughs> scale. But you just scale it down. It's it's super simple to s- scale some of that right. down sometimes. And I was just squishing the uh, the uh, in a, a, a smaller footprint, just pushing it up against that that earthen wall that it's up against. And the whole reason why it's in a bowl is to hide all of the uh, 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 art 
and assets uh, or outers in Stranglethorn. We didn't want a frame rate problem for anybody mm -hmm. fighting monsters near Booty Bay. So our walls hide geometry as far as the rendering. Like if you're if you're on one side of the hill, uh, your machine doesn't get uh, it doesn't draw the objects on the other side of the hill. Okay, so there's occlusion on the terrain, which means uh, you get faster frame rate. So that's what is weak time. It was very early in uh, on the project. So uh, seeing that we could then go, oh, wow, we can actually do razor fin downs. That's nice. And oh, wow, we can do, you know, the final, uh, we can do Black Rock Mountain. You know, we, we had an idea of how many polys we could work with. Mm. And that is huge because yeah. at the time, oh, you didn't know how much optimization. We didn't want to be too conservative and miss the cool geometry, but it was just too early to tell. So. So it sounds like there was a lot of learning process going on while, you know, during the development and even after the launch, you know, oh, you, yeah. you saw things like, like, oh, these dungeons, maybe they're a little bit too long. Maybe we can go into doing shorter dungeons. And I have a question why, you know, we had, of course, in vanilla, we had uh, instanced and not instanced, um, but, but you really didn't see too many non-instanced dungeons after vanilla. You know what the reason for that was or? Um, well, it was, we had kind of <clears throat> exhausted ourselves. Uh, first of all, they each need a texture set and hiring texture artists was another pain point. We had a hard time hiring level designers. We had even a more harder time, uh, hiring level, uh, or dungeon, uh, texturers. It's, a, it's, it's even rarer than a 3d level designer. Wow. So, uh, their time was always the most precious and a micro dungeon which is, which is what we call anything that was non-instance we just called a micro dungeon and so to do a micro um we don't get a lot of bang for the buck you know you yeah. get somebody doing a quest they go in and out and you know then it's kind of done but i'd done like 15 mountain caves so they could just take one of my mountain caves and you know worst case scenario just re wrap a different texture around it or lighter, make a lighter texture or darker or change the color and you have a new uh, texture set. Um, but if you're actually doing a completely new um, uh, micro dungeon, then yeah, it's, it, it takes, it takes a lot of uh, resources. And frankly, uh, you just, I hate to say this, but you sometimes run out when you're just going into an interior. There's only so many, human memes like we'd done classical greek or the night of we'd done you know the egyptians had their feel uh the uh, you know the titan is you know the roman look uh uh babylonians nobody knows who what the babylonians did you know or or just <laughs> the the acadians you know no you know as right. soon as you go you, you just don't know so there's it's and you want to start with something that's like that it's very very hard to invent uh, a new type of architecture. Yeah. Uh, That's a good point. So, riffing off of Def Camp's question, do you have, so when we, we say non instant dungeon, a lot of us in the community have a, maybe a different perception of what you would call a micro dungeon. So, did you have any, in addition to the cave systems and all that stuff, did you have anything that was, it, any hand in developing things like Pyrewood Village in Silver Pine Forest, uh, Jintha Lore in the Hinterlands, or a Gammon Mills in Tears Fall, these kind of like micro dungeons that require group con groups to uh, complete? Do you mean like the crypts? Yeah, like Gammon Mills is a crypt system. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did all the crypts too. Awesome, um, okay. I love the yeah, crypts. Yeah, pretty I much. The... <laughs> yeah, all the micro dungeons. I'm, well, no, not all of them, uh, like 90% of them. Uh, and, and frankly, I, I stepped on the shoulders of other people too. Like when Dana Jan would build the gold mine, I'd say, okay, looks good to me. I can, I can take the ball and run with it from here. And I just, you know, the, uh, Mulgore, uh, gold mine, the blasted land, uh, blasted lands, uh, gold mine. Um, you just, you just, you just run with it. You know, um, I think I did the, let's see what, what's it called in the staring gorge, the, uh, dark mines. Anyway, uh, 
yeah, but but the Crips and stuff, yeah, uh, I did all the Crips. In fact, that's where the Skullmans came from. It was started mm-hmm. out as just a Crypt. Oh yeah, I can see that definitely. Um, so so there's a lot of I made a video recently about unfinished areas of classic wow and it's funny that we're talking to someone who's actually developing so um yeah and I, i'm using the term unfinished of course uh, loosely I, I mean, i'm sure there's a lot of things you guys wanted to put in the game the but yeah, yeah yeah so like uh so one of them is like oldham or dark dark whisper gorge which is in winter spring grim batol which is the wild hammer base for the wild hammer dwarves right. were these places supposed to be raids okay. or like questing areas do you do you remember now, you know what's funny? Uh, the reason the, – the question the, – the areas that I, I'm most familiar with are all the abandoned micro dungeons around uh, Karazhan. That's one mm-hmm. everybody asks for. But honestly, what limits the amount of uh, things that were added to WoW wasn't – I was at a point where I was creating content faster – I was creating more content than what players needed. Wow. And the what – what I mean by that is that there are only so many care. Uh, there are only so many item slots on the paper doll on 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 the character. Okay, you've got the head, the legs, the chest, and once every couple levels, a player will switch because it's a meaningful change. You know, uh, it, it, we learned that makes sense as you're leveling up because. You're not going to stick around unless you're really getting all the armor from that area. You're going to, you're going to move past it. Uh, and it also is like uh, you're forced to, well, the mogs now, you know, you can, you can change them. But uh, the, the thing about uh, the, the abandoned areas is that we just didn't need those areas. We have entire zones where like dead wind was going to get a lot more yeah. uh, uh, attention, but. In the no shower, I'm guessing as well. Sure, Ashara. Um, where's Anixia's cave? I forget. Uh, oh, Dustwell Marsh. Yeah, that. Um, there's just there's a lot of zones that uh, just really no need for that much. And that was also when uh, leveling faster. Well, that made a lot of content obsolete, and people would just play again. But people also have a tendency to put. Uh, uh, follow the path of the least resistance. So they'd end up playing the same content over and over sometimes yeah. and really have to go out of their way to actually see something different. Um, but yeah, when we learned how uh, how fast um, we thought our game was going to actually take a lot longer to reach high level mm-hmm. because it was just revolutionary to make people level that fast. It was just... Yeah. Is a completely we had the rest system was yeah. a new thing, and a lot of people freaked out when they heard about it. Uh, but I think that's what made WoW just accessible to a yeah. lot of people, and a lot of the success comes from that. And you know, we learned that late when we had built so many other areas. So whether or not uh, Grim Patrol was a, a raid, um, it would it would come from the designer saying, "No, we don't." need any we can't give any more items like at best they could only items Mm. okay items that have no value because they got those items at that level from upper black rock spire or uh the molten core or something like that um we had uh the idea of it's with fire gear for the molten core and um that was abandoned because it just the items didn't feel at, I I think we kind of had a lot of inflation when we made that decision, but uh, that, that's just the nature of the beast. Right. Uh, you mentioned the um, the fact that players were leveling, you know, in WoW a lot faster than other games. And in terms of WoW, I think a lot of people look at vanilla WoW in particular as being um, hardcore, you know. But I think WoW in general is a <laughs> lot a more casual for friendly of an EverQuest and things like that. And, uh, oh, do you think yeah. the, the accessibility of WoW led to its success? Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, the guys who are listening to this podcast, I mean, every, you know, the people listening to this or who know of WoWhead or know of, uh, you know, WoWpedia, 
uh, it's really a small uh, segment of the population. Like I remember when we first shipped, wow, I did a, a I went to a convention on Long Island, uh, the Icon, and uh, I just did a talk and the room was filled with, I, I would say about 200. And I said like, who's level 60? Okay. Cause I had a level 60. I can ask that question, right? You know, <laughs> who's level 60, you know, and like two or three people raise their hands. You know, they just don't have a lot of time. And to me, it's like, really, really, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm a, I have a totally different lifestyle than these yeah. guys, but that's the bulk of the audience. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like we stumbled into um, a game that was that successful by making as many quests as we did. Mm. Uh, originally, we were just going to use quests to familiarize people with these zones so they wouldn't get lost in them. Wow. And people used uh, uh, the quest log as like when they, they said, well, I'm done with this zone. I'm now going to the uh, the next zone. And right. they went to a zone that was way too high for them to actually play in. And then they got their ass kicked. Which yeah. It's not the, the goal of the game. We, you know, we, we, we don't want to mislead people. So we'd said that over and over. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely because we, we don't we don't have a budget for that. We've got oh, at the time uh, we were when I was hired, we had a budget of maybe 40 people, maybe 40 wow. people to make World of Warcraft. Wow. And then as the project ground and ground and ground, it went up to 45 and 50. And, you know, we got some quest designers from uh, QA, uh, which, you know, they were stoked. All, all the you know, most of the di designers came from QA anyway. Um, so. Yeah, we ended up with like, like half a dozen quest designers. Wow. Who knew, you know? And it was just because the editor was so crazy, you could do anything with the quest. Yeah. So uh, that they, they were uh, they were a lot more complicated than the producers could handle. And so the producers talked to Mike Morhai and said, "Oh yeah, we need a bigger team," you know. Uh, and as the project went on. Uh, it became more and more apparent by how addicted the other teams were to World of Warcraft that we were going to have a hit on our hands, and then he could uh, sleep at night, getting uh, more money to do the project uh, that was way, way, way more expensive than anything Blizzard had ever even dreamed uh, that it would uh, uh, be. So um, yeah, so we we just budgeted for more people. Yeah. Um so Matt, I, I, Def Cam, I think Def Cam had a few questions concerning like yeah. how the game changed. But so we're gonna ask a few questions about that, uh, and then I'd like to sure. move into listener questions, if that's cool. So, sure. uh, yeah. so yeah. Def Cam, let's ask you your questions about the evolution yeah, of WoW, and then kind we'll... of a follow up about what we just talked about with the, ca the casual uh, accessibility of it. Um, do you? So over, I think the uh, time in WoW, it seems like the game became a little bit uh, more casual friendly, more casual friendly. Um, and I think, I, you know, I, I don't know why this was, but do you think that was just to try and, um, you know, reach out to the viewer base or was this something that we all know that Blizzard likes to listen to their fans, you know, they try to, uh, you know, make their fans as happy as they can. But what I'm trying to get at is where there's sometimes where the developers wanted to go one way, but they, the, the, they were also trying to make the fans happy. Absolutely. Does that ever clash? Did that clash oh, a lot? Where the fans the only, wanted, okay, let's get... <laughs> the, the, the only reason at all that there's an auction house is because of the fans. That's really? the only reason. Uh, Blizzard wanted people to be talking to one another. It was a social game. Uh, social mechanics to uh, keep people uh, connected to the game. This is the theory a long period of time because there was no way we could keep making new content uh, for people. It was just, uh, there's just people who will, will always just go through content faster than we can create them. So uh, everything was done to make sure uh, people were social. Um, limiting griefing uh, killed a whole bunch of ideas, you know, like, the, yeah. it, but still, I mean, that, that was definitely the best. That was definitely the best, uh, um, uh, decision to, to right. yeah get rid of griefing, but now the auction house came as a uh, I think it was I don't want to say if it was thought bot, but somebody came up with a, a plugin that 
was um, it was basically a, it was a second economy that players would um, through I don't I, I can't remember how it would work, but it, it was through chat that they would like somehow sell and share. It was almost like um, a Craigslist or something. Huh. Um, and if you didn't get this plugin, then you were outside that economy. Uh, and that economy uh, was uh, faster. I mean, as soon as you automate something, you know, I mean, right. you automate Wall Street, it's going to be faster. Uh, and it was going to go faster than these poor guys who were doing it the way we envisioned it, that they would log in and they would just be typing in a, a trade chat selling gloves level yeah. 45 uh, mage gloves level 45 you know just typing that over and over but through that there's a there's a human element you, you start up uh conversations it's oddly uh, we, it's kind of ironic that the diet stuff is what actually gives uh people opportunities to socialize it's with one yeah another. and 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 we knew that and that's kind of why we were forcing people to sell their stuff through trading, On walking trade up to someone and or, handing, yeah, yeah and, and trade. Exactly. And this auction house absolutely was this automated thing that killed that needed to get that plug in to be a part of that economy. So we couldn't prevent players from keep making versions of that plug in. And frankly, we kind of liked that plug in too. So it wasn't like, <laughs> you know, sure. you know, we had angels and devils on our, on our yeah. shoulders as we we're like making these decisions. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so that was probably, it was, it was disturbing that the players were changing, but frankly, you can't argue with data. If that's how people wanted to play then, you know, yeah, that's, you know, that's the, the quests are another reason, you know, we couldn't keep players in the zone. As soon as they left their quests, they'd leave the zone. And that was just absolutely the opposite of what we wanted them to do it was sending people out to zones. They couldn't actually, you know, uh, conquer. So, uh, there's that, um, oh, geez, uh, raids, people found ways to exploit raids and we learned, uh, what we could and couldn't do with a lot of our uh, fights. Um, cheeses that were kind of like not really cheating, but you, I don't know. I, yeah, we, yeah, we had uh, some fights like uh, Fire Moth. That's right. Fire Moth had a line of sight. So it was the most broken fire raid would just stack up on top of one another and <laughs> fight this dragon and one guy would only he'd be the only guy doing like, the fire damage which was really not how we envisioned the fight was going to go <laughs> so uh, like okay, okay so i actually have played the mini game of uh line of sight breaking you know that mm. that's just a mechanic that is taken out of the uh, the tool chest as as ways to make uh, fights interesting and that's you know you work with you know what you got right right so okay oh. you go ahead, Def oh. Camp. I, yeah go ahead I, I, okay i just want so going on from that now we saw uh i think maybe you would agree with me on this but uh wow today i don't know if you still play wow but i know you you've seen wow over its uh transitions is inherently uh it's 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 it's, it's a different game that it used to be you know sure. there was but a lot of changes, uh, things, a lot of quality of life changes. Um, I guess my question is, yeah. were these changes more to kind of quell the masses or were they uh, developer changes that wanted to go through? Because a lot of these changes they look back upon now and a lot of the same people who were asking for these changes are saying, oh, this is what ruined the game. This is, you know, this is that. Yeah, a lot of it I think is just learning. Like uh... – as a game designer, you have ideas of what sounds fun. Okay, you have an idea. Say you have a whatever it is, an activity. Uh, for an MMO, you have to ask yourself: Is it variation to this? Uh, so a lot of things. It's a it's a learning process, and that covers everything from traveling from place to place. Uh, at one point, you were just basically porting everywhere because it was more convenient and players didn't want any downtime. They wanted yeah. to get in and get out. But like I said, uh, 
you lose your socialization when you take out the boring period, you know, yep. the, the boring periods of time. So Absolutely. it's basically, you're not going to make everybody happy. Uh, uh, an MMO is everything to everyone. So one segment of the audience is going to be happy with a change while the other section is going to be, you know, uh, screaming bloody murder. Yeah. Uh, so you can never really make everybody happy, but, uh, no, I think it's, it evolves. You, you're, you, you're constantly learning. I, I I'm tempted to say that, well, you have different people in charge and they want to try their own mm-hmm. things, but really it's, it's all about learning. I mean, that's it. You, you learn to actually see people behave in the long run. You know, what is the end game of this? Can we head the head off? You know, if it, if it deteriorates into broken behavior as a way to head that off and then, then we can re, you know, do it the right way. And, and I, like I said, I, I don't play, uh, I can't play computer games anywhere, uh, because right. of a problem with my hands. So I was on a while for 10, 10 years, but, uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, and there was a point, I think I quit before, uh, uh, I, I quit in Northrend and I worked through, through Cataclysm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I uh, left the team, moved to that gotcha. different project. So before we jump into the listener questions, I think that there's a question that's on everyone's mind. And I want to start with a quote you said in Count on yep. the Classic. And you said, you're the developer, make it your own. Is that mm-hmm. what is that what is that what's taking Blizzard so long <laughs> in putting on class? I know it's a much more complex question. I know that... We're all chopping at the bit. We want this game to come out tomorrow, yesterday. So, like, can you just briefly elaborate, like, are, is it because of creative, creative license that it's taking so long, or is it just a huge undertaking? Or is it a combination of both? Well, um, it's important to realize <clears throat> that everything I know is speculation, okay? And one thing I hammer on early in the book unless you're in the room, in the meeting where the decision is taking place, you have no idea what's going on. Okay. And I'm happy to speculate. It's fun to speculate. You know, I mean, we do it with sports and politics and, you know, but unless you're in the room, you have no idea what's going on, but I've been through the ringer. I know what it takes to make an MMO. And I also have, you know, I, you know, after blizzard, I, I'm hiring people for, you know, a pro- new, new game, new project. And you see that people, a developer, if you want a good developer, they're not someone who wants to step in somebody else's footprints. You know, they want to stand on their own two feet. They want to make their own decisions. That's the joy of it. That's the joy of developing is you're, you're in the act of creating something, whether you're a programmer or an artist or writer. And you're, if you're redoing a game. I the article that I'm gonna come out with on <laughs> Wowhead about the uh, uh, remaking uh, Warsong Gulch from a remake three map that was a remake of a Quake two map. Okay, <laughs> I hated remaking mm. that map from Quake th- uh, two to Quake three. It is so not fun. It's it it's 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 a joyless exercise. It's an MMO. It's 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 a way more, more harder than is commonly known. Hopefully, this book puts uh, a little clearer definition of how painful it is to make an MMO. Uh, uh, so that's you know my prediction. I said it's not gonna. It, if I you know gun to my head, I had to make a prediction. I don't think it's coming out before 2020. Okay, that's oh. that's only a year and a half from now. That's nothing for on an MMO development. That is that that's a blink of an eye. I'm, now I know that it's right now. It's been done before, and you know what works. You think you know, but there's going to be just this, this internal pressure to do things different, mm. and you have to make your employees happy. You can't. It's hard enough making. There's a. I go over all the morale problems that the WoW team had. There's a. That's a. In, in at at the tail end of the book, you start seeing where you know departments not talking to each other. Right. I yeah. mean, it gets pretty hairy. It gets really hairy. It's so hard. And my I. 
I, I hope it's not as hard as what I'm imagining it. And again, this is complete speculation. I'm not talking to anybody on you know, on Blizzard. Right, they right. certainly would not talk to anybody who's not a <laughs> no. you know part of the family anymore. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm getting no in information. Yeah. But it's it's going to be hard. So just a quick follow up: <clears throat> How much different do you think Classic will be compared to Vanilla? And you can give me a percentage, you can give me an example. And do you think that the developers owe it to the player base to keep the game as close as it was to Vanilla as possible? No. They owe, they owe absolutely... Okay, this is me, John Stats. I'm not a representative <laughs> of Blizzard. You owe absolutely nothing to anyone other than uh, the players of the game and making your game fun. Because... People evolve. People have learned. Once people see another type of game, like say, I don't know, Fortnite, uh, changes the way first-person shooters are going to be played. You know, it, or or uh, you get a new evolution in that type of game. That to be loyal to a player base, it's not. Yeah, it it just doesn't make as much sense other than trusting your own voice and saying this is what's going to be more fun. Uh, how close will it be? I, I think it's, it's going to be, oh boy, it's so hard to say because WoW is constantly evolving with every patch. Right. And you guys know right. about the patches. You don't even know about the hot fixes, okay? <laughs> the hot fixes fixing all the bugs. Right. You know, we just we don't even tell you about it because it's it's we don't want to broadcast that we fixed a, a cheat, you know, right. or, or, or we patched a, a security flaw. Um, so uh, in all the art bugs and stuff, I think to me, vanilla wow means a slower leveling curve that okay. things are, okay. are, are, are harder to attain uh, where conveniences are uh, not there. Now I'm going to backpedal from that because I would want a dungeon finder. Okay. That was not fun at all. In World of Warcraft, trying to get a dungeon, uh, and I and I I support JL and Breck a hundred percent when he says you think you want vanilla WoW, but you really really don't. <laughs> they had aggro back then. You had you couldn't have rogues pull aggro. There's you know taunting had its limits. So that's vanilla WoW, and uh, uh, my my article about Skullmance is is was born on the pain that it was just when you slog until two in the morning to do a full clear and somebody drops out just because they have to go to work tomorrow. Yeah. Your group can, you can't find anybody for skull mance. That really, really sucks. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, if, I think it's going to be, I would say, I would say 70% close to Vanilla WoW, um, way more improved than Vanilla WoW, uh, hopefully uh, less accessible than the later, because I think that's what people really mean when they talk about Vanilla WoW. Uh, but again, you have to ask yourself, how, how long are the legs on this thing? Are we going to kill the molten core creatures for one full year, three full years? Like, how long do you want to be in the same creatures in molten core over and over and over? And if you're going to spend that much money in making an MMO, you better know you have to have these dancers before you begin because things get expensive and you're hiring people and they're moving to Orange County. It's it's expensive all around. So, you know, if anybody can do it, Blizzard can do it. But, uh, you know, my hat's off to them for trying. Well, one thing I think is really interesting, you know, you see there's already, a, a, you know, a big, uh, a relatively big uh, community that play on, you know, the private servers. Right, right. That, right. that play, you know, I myself, uh, you know, sure. dabble it in. And, uh, you know, it's and I think a lot of people um, – question is say okay wow you look at and see these guys who who did this with private servers and they re-released this and they think you know why can't blizzard do this or something right. you know similar similar like it in a uh, short amount of time and you know and 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 i myself before i i 
kind of did some digging and you know looked at sure. how <laughs> how much work that actually you know yeah. would entail for them yeah. to do something like this because you're not you're, you're thinking of like you know these guys got one server you know that they're playing it with five thousand people right it's a lot different than a company putting something out there that where millions of people can can play on you know what I mean there's a lot more that goes into it and um but you know there are like I myself you know and and you know I look at uh you know I, I've played WoW for a long time I actually recently. Uh, just stop playing on the retail servers. So, you know, not to like still dabble on there once in a while. I mean, I haven't played uh, the new expansion yet or anything like that. Um, and I play, you know, on private servers as well. And it's like, you know, there are those things, those those things that, of course, are not uh, fun. Like you said, like someone dropping out of Skolo, yeah. you know, like like three yeah. hours into it. Okay, guys, we have no other option but to four-man it now. Like, like what, what else do we do? We don't have a world I'll back out. You know, so um, I think, but I do think there are like a, a group of people that, you know, look at that and they see the flaws of it and they say, okay. I, I think what Mark Kern called flaws. the proven market, I think you're talking about, right? Mark Kern's proven, proven right. market. Yeah. yeah, yeah, proven market. Sure. You know, they have these flaws that they, they know what's uh, coming at it. But do you think, uh, so do you think while uh, Blizzard is going to try to, I mean, they're going to try to draw on as many people as they can with this, right? They're going to try to draw in the people that they lost that uh, stopped playing WoW because of whatever reasons. They also are going to want to draw more people. But the great thing is that they have, they're going to have two options. They're going to have you know, the, the, the current game and the retail game. But do you think that they're going to try to well, – what we're saying with this, with the whole you know, 70% thing, that they're going to try to make it how they do a lot and please the masses and try to say, okay, you guys are going to get, you know, some of what you like here and some of what you like here and some of what you like. Well, you, you probably have a, a better understanding. How long was that server up from, do, do you know from beginning to end how long it lasted? The Stauris? Are we talking about the Stauris? Yeah, the Stauris. It was pretty short lived. I think less than uh, a year, I believe. Yeah. Less yeah. than a year. Um, but there are other ones up now using basically. Yeah, I didn't start on launch day. I did. I did play on right. the stories, but I didn't start on launch day. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a. I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but um. I mean, it, they could just reboot the server, you know, do a just do a wipe, uh, but wasn't that? I mean, that was free to play too, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, a lot and of them they accept, profit. like donations and yeah. yeah. And let me tell you something. You're, 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 that's apples to oranges, you know, how, how popular would it have been at, you know, if, you know, $15 a month or something like, you know, true. Cause, cause frankly, they're not, they're not supporting any developer salaries. They're not supporting, uh, uh, what you mentioned, uh, cut customer service in a, a cent a month, then you have to support your product. Okay. And, uh, you know, I can't, I'm sure they could have forward this you know um I, it's 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 really not something I, i've never been i've never played the server uh and they could just do that just do it do a complete wipe but i also know how developers think someone's going to come up with a really cool idea mm. if it's a cool idea uh say the the, the live servers today uh do you propagate it to you know Classic WoW, right. you know, or the reverse. Do, do, you, do, do you propagate it from Classic WoW to, now that's probably a bit easier. Um, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I think, I mean, they could, but, uh, you know, if this Blizzard wants it to be also successful, you know, right. Um, right. and they don't, they don't want to hurt their own product because, uh, you know, if let's say it's cheaper, you know, since it's, it's five dollars a month or something like that, uh, uh, there, I mean, do half if half of the guild moves to a product that the other half doesn't want to play, that could traumatize a lot of uh communities. And, and wow, I mean, it's 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 now a competing product, right. uh, so. You know, I don't want to come off as somebody who has actually thought this out. You may be, <laughs> I, I can give you the developer's perspective, yeah. but um, uh, Blizzard had to shut that server down yeah. because as soon as somebody does it for free, then the next person can, you know, now they're competing with their own products. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, 
I don't know. Yeah, I can't get into yeah, an no, answer that's, for that. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, that's uh, a, so you were surprised, I guess, when they announced uh, the classic servers? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because for them to do that, they really had to look at the long view and say, can we deliver a good product? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of opinions. Boy, the, just just based on the uh, the the the, the uh, we would debate till after midnight sometimes. Right. How could we have a social game and rip out the in- or, 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 or or force instances on private uh, dungeons? It doesn't make any sense. You know, are we killing the, what the magic behind uh, an MMO? So right. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, like all of the the really long-term implications of doing this. Uh, I don't, I really don't. So. Definitely interested to see yeah, what happens. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. So John, I do have one question yeah. that all of our Discord people were saying, I know what Melderon's going to ask. I know what Melderon's going to ask. Were shamans supposed uh-huh. to be viable tanks at any time during vanilla development? Um, no, originally, um, Damn. Rob Pardo, he, he, <laughs> yeah, he, Rob Pardo wanted roles in, in, in classes, and uh, shamans were kind of a utility, uh, a little mix of everything. Um, and the, the thirds and, uh, well, the hybrid classes weren't going to be as effective as the pure classes. And so that weren't completely uh, clear uh, until, you know, players started to get uninvited from raids because they weren't right playing the right class, you know? Right. So then they made pa- Paladins, Vala, you know, I don't think Paladins had taunt. Uh, so no, that, they didn't have taunt really, no, yeah, yeah, so they, they couldn't tank, even though they had the best armor. So unforeseen problems. And yeah. I see, like, a lot of classes, even with, like, uh, Dungeons and Finder. I'm a path, Pathfinder player. Like, nice. they yeah, go away from... They go away from the extremes. I'm playing two point oh right now. Neener, neener, neener. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> I, sl- I slipped that in there. Yeah, I like um, that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm in the. I, yeah, I'm play testing it right now. Awesome. But oh, the that's... movement away from the extremes of playing one role to more hybrid, and that's just from tabletop. You'll see a lot of you know, like a lot of classes have healing mechanics now. Uh, and that's just, you know, tabletop to everything. Um, uh, my dungeon game gets rid of classes, you know. Um, the, the, yeah, so, yeah, the old stuff, a little bit more painful. You can't do it all. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. So we're going to do some, uh, I want to try to, let's try to do this rapid fire as possible. We have some listener right. questions that I like, that I like to cover before we um, sure. talk, talk about your future and what you'll be doing and, and we can say, Unfortunately, say goodnight, but whatever. We, we, we'll, 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 uh, we can stay here and talk for hours. So the first one is actually not a question. It's a point that was on a, a Def Talk, our last Def Talk by Taladril, who's a theory crafter and a druid, over druid enthusiasts. And he said that Vanilla was in beta even when it was live. How does that statement basically, basically saying you guys were learning a lot while the game was live and it was still very beta-y, if you will? Uh... How do you oh, feel about that? Yeah, like, okay. yeah, is, is that true? Sentiment? Oh, it's it's true today. It's true yeah. today. I mean, we're seeing every new system. Uh, you have player housing. You're gonna, you know, you have your ideas. Okay, you know, then you get punched in the face. You yeah. know, like that 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 idea doesn't fall fly the way you think it is, or it kills another system elsewhere in the game. You know, why why would I do just have my you know my minions? You know make gold this way. So now you've got a, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's true almost with every game. I mean, just wow has the luxury of evolving as time goes by. If you're right. if you, back in the old days, when you ship a, a product, you put it on a shelf, you install it, you play the game and it is what it is. And if you don't like it tough, <laughs> you know, it. but uh, yeah. That, that that that's a fair statement. I mean, yeah, that and and I think that it's going to evolve five years from now. Someone's yeah. going to yeah. think of something. You know, that's what I it agree. Is. All right, next one comes from Early Bird, who's one of our patrons on Patreon. I would like to know what what location on Azeroth he was most proud of. Uh, we we already said BRD, so maybe your second most proud. You could do that. 
and if it has, right. and if you've had been contacted by Blizzard to work on Vanilla, you can answer that if you wish. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I'm out of game development, so uh, yeah, I, uh, my, yeah, my, my hands can't really play it. So uh, yeah, it's board games for me. But uh, for my, for my most proud area, I would probably say the Slag Pits. Believe oh. it or not, uh, nice. those were. I redid the area. Uh, it, it was a bunch of booty bay textures, uh, orc uh, watchtowers. Um, there were orcs in the zone, and it just it clashed with the Syrian Gorge. It didn't. They right. didn't look like those assets. Bleached, sun bleached, yellowish type of textures in the Syrian Gorge. This dark dystopia type of area. It was just the weirdest thing. Uh, that was probably the biggest improvement. Uh, Black Rock Mountain is yeah. by far the, the you know as far as uh, uh, when I rebuilt Lockmadon Dam, I think that got a lot better uh, than what yeah. was there before. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, the next one's from uh, the Sipulo, another patron on Patreon. I'd like to know how Blizzard reacted to the unexpected massive turnout at launch and the rise in popularity in the following months. Perhaps uh, just a quick overview of how surprised you guys may have been at the popularity of WoW. Um, well, yeah, it was, uh, we were shocked. We were shocked because our pre-sales were so terrible. That's, that's the yardstick most uh, game wow. companies use to, they, they don't know. You, you wonder, you don't want to manufacture tons and tons and tons of discs, uh, unless, uh, you, you, you need to. Okay. And the, the pre-orders are what all game companies uh, so that's how they decide how many to manufacture. And our, we had no pre-orders. We, it was very low. And we were shocked. We were shocked. Um, we were surprised that uh, Korea wasn't a big market for us. They didn't, they didn't particularly like World of Warcraft. It was too complicated. Uh, you couldn't play with a cigarette in, your, in their hand. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of Koreans uh, had smoked at the time. That's uh, one reason you can play StarCraft with, you know, uh, with your mouse hand is super busy, but, you know, you have your cigarette. And Diablo was the same way. You didn't, you could have, do Diablo with, you know, one hand. Uh, uh, there We were crushed under a weight of bugs and feedback and changes. So there wasn't a lot of celebration. I mean, we had not stopped crunching. Uh, it was... Uh, it was kind of dark times. Yeah, it was actually a pretty low morale on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the artists didn't play in the most. And if you're not playing World of Warcraft, it's just the gig that we didn't you know. It was just, it was not a, a, a fun time. Uh, it just didn't seem like we were ever going to end. Other games, there's closure. You know, like you say, okay, I've done that. Now what's the new project that I get to work on? Oh, it's, no, it's more of World of Warcraft. In fact, what you're going to be doing is fixing bugs while trying to keep up with the audience demand of more content. Um, yeah, that's a fair dev developer reaction. Nice. All right, next one comes from Dunedain, who's a uh, friend of the channel. He actually wrote three really good questions, but I'm probably only getting maybe one or two of these. But... John said he often made dungeons too big. I wonder if he thinks BRD is too big, because in my opinion, it's a masterpiece. Yeah. I also wonder if he would create if you if you could create a dungeon today, would you make it linear or more like a maze? BRD was if you had free total free artistic, uh, you were able to do whatever you right. want. How would you build a dungeon basically? Uh, I like the non-linear approach of BRD. Um, I would cut dungeons down. I would put the instance. The biggest change would be put the instance in the front, get rid of all the plus mobs. Uh, oh, the, the elite just, mobs outside. Yeah. Yeah, right. the elite mobs were just. I. I yeah, it was uh, our attempt of giving. Uh, they wanted to recreate Lower Guck, which was a dungeon in EverQuest where people would kill things. Then when they'd get a party size big enough to do Lower Guck, then they would go into the dungeon. But uh, you already had that by the time. So they were just a pain in the butt. They didn't give you get good loot so i'd probably uh uh just move the instance closer to the front <laughs> i like to have very credible areas um to do and just like free reign i i, I never liked getting uh blueprints blueprints kind of sucks because mm -hmm. you're discovering things while you're working and right. if you don't have the freedom to just uh you know add 
this or that, you know, it, 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 you're losing a lot of opportunities. So. Yeah. Okay, this comes from a Discord uh, member named Ravage, and I have to apologize. He gave me six well well written questions, but they're huge, and I'm we're gonna oh, get go to ahead. one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. So, optimization and limitations. <clears throat> Blizzard games are always tuned to work on low end PCs. What kind of sacrifices did you and your other artists have to make to avoid crippling FPS problems? Were there times you had created something too elaborate and had to cut down or simplified? How did the unknown factor of players fit in the overarching optimization strategy? Are any concerns about having too many players crammed into an area like Orgrimmar or Ironforge? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, when we built the cities, we didn't know what gameplay was actually going to be in the cities. We had no idea. We thought quest givers are going to be in the cities, and it turned out, no, that wasn't the case. So uh, we put trade skills. We didn't have alc auction houses. We didn't you know, anything from au auction houses when we built the cities. So, um, yeah, that was a big concern. Uh, the largest, largest load on the video card was uh, the number. It actually wasn't the environments. The environments um, were actually a small part because every player is a unique texture. They're all baked together. And so if you have 20 different players, you got 20 different textures and 20 different models. Um, but the... Like Ogremar would be like maybe 30 Ogremar, at least vanilla Lau textures. Um, the or there, um, it but if you have 60 people, you have no control over where to go. That was that's a big deal, and yeah, we had areas where there are too many props. A lot of the exterior level designers were always cluttering the places with too many props. You look behind yourself and you're like, oh wow, there's too many objects here. And then <clears throat> most of the exterior guys would try to get away with it anyway, and the uh, uh, the engine programmers would <laughs> say, nope, nope, wrong, 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 wrong. No, the programmers were always there as the uh, the watchdogs for frame rate. Yeah, they they kept everybody on the straight and narrow. Cool. All right, one more question from Ravage because it's a really good one. Alterac Valley, it's the only one of the three original battlegrounds that don't that doesn't employ any kind of symmetry. Care to explain the thought process behind this? One might conclude that AV is simply preoccupied with pretending to be a real place rather than being balanced competitive PvP. How do you balance aesthetics versus gameplay? Which one takes priority? Uh, um, well that's wow, that's a good question. Um uh, Alterac Valley was, let's see, we were trying a F3 map where you were escorting, uh, you were, 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 that was, that was the original vision and it an escort quest. Oh, sorry. Into, you said an escort. Uh, uh, no, like, you know how like a Warcraft three map, uh, oh. you have peons and all kinds of, yes. of mobs yes. just yeah. streaming toward the battlefront. Okay. That was kind of the vision for Alterac Valley. Um, Ooh. Artistically, uh, we wanted to make it look different, but actually be symmetrical. Um, it was more artistic than it was symmetrical <laughs> as, <laughs> as a result. Um, but we didn't know that that mattered very much. Uh, the, the, uh, the exterior level designer who was working on it, uh, he griped a little bit while he was working on it. He said, he doesn't know why this place has to be so big. He, you know, uh, and there was a point in development when there was a, that was an unpopular, uh, uh, mode of play. It was, there were too many quests, too many mobs, too many side things to do. And we just didn't know how players were going to behave. We, we had all those, uh, uh, you know, like killing, uh, things in mines and killing rams and stuff to 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 farm a resource that spawns a uh, an NPC that put. Uh, we thought that we we wanted to accommodate the more casual players who didn't want to do well in PvP, who would just kill little things, you know, off from the side where out of the way. But he's contributing. To, she's contributing to the battle, and people like that. And as it turns out, it was really, really boring to do because <laughs> the mobs were a little bit tougher than act, than, and you never got any loot from it. And there's just no positive feedback from that experience. So, uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll track that. It has a lot of uh, problems. Uh, symmetry wasn't uh, some other <laughs> things that we learned. Yeah. 
I, I mean, AV is in a very unique place, and I think a lot of people I love, love it. it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love the fact that you can go in there and just I played it many times. Yeah. Play it for two or three days straight. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, the, 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 the what, what really works about AV is that you have different groups. You're playing in different areas, like you know, yeah. over and over and over again. You're in the same areas over and over and over again. Okay. In all track valley, okay. Well, there was the bridge. That's where yeah. most oh, of yeah. the hat. You know, it always. But in theory, the asymmetry was going to mix it up a little bit. Uh, but apparently, once one group realizes it's going to happen at the bridge, they wouldn't travel any further than the bridge. And so right. you have these weird voodoo things where players learn the wrong lesson from previous experiences, <laughs> and everybody just falls into a groove of doing, you know, yeah. it's, and it ends up being a little bit less organic than what you want it to be. Wow. So. Hey, John, I just got a question from someone on um, – was Caladir – the word Caladir ring a bell? Caladir? It was in the map files apparently. Uh, Caladar? Caladar, yeah. Caladar. What is that? Caladar, yeah. Uh, that's the – isn't that the world tree? That's a night off zone. I yeah, think. so so Chaldrassil, it Calendar, became – it became yeah. No, and no, no, Caladar. It became – so the, the guy's okay. question was – it was. Uh, he said maybe it became T- Teldrassil, which is the world tree. Was that the original uh, name for Teldrassil? Yeah. yeah, they used a couple. See, what's funny is when you refer to names, a lot of the names happened at the last month of the project. Like Skullmance was the Keep Micro Dungeon, okay, okay. for the longest mm-hmm. time, and then when uh, we it was a school of necromancy, and then. Chris Metzen gave us Skull of Mance. We were like, oh, really? I mean, <laughs> Skull of Necro Skull of Mance, <laughs> really? We're going to be that? And, uh, but, yeah, uh, so the names were really flipping around. Uh, when, when a new area would pop pop out, sometimes Metzen would say, well, we'll use Kaldar for that, you know. Kaldar, so okay. it was yeah. different things. You know, there's only so many words that really roll off the tongue, you know. Yeah. Uh, so. That was a guy named Tarluk on uh, Classic Wild Discord. Okay, one more question from the listeners. This one's kind of an interesting one. So I'm going to upload an image to the Discord chat. And this guy wanted me to put this image up here, so you would, you should be able to see it. And for your listeners on naughty. for the listeners on YouTube, you'll I'll put it in the actual video when you're looking at it. If you're on a podcast, check over the on the YouTube channel. All right. So basically, this is a GM. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you know what this is. Okay. So there's the, so these little check marks. He knows what all the check marks are. So you can like you can enter like God mode. You can enter. So if you guys are if you guys are on a podcast, basically I'm uploading an image showing the GM screen and how the GMs can manipulate the game. He wants to know what all those little icons are below. He has no idea what those are and what they do. Oh, uh, okay, so I don't think that this is actually this looks like a designer tool. This is what the designers would use. Now this is me guessing, okay, because I've actually never used this. Uh, by the way. Um, oh, that's funny. Realm 3.10 is for closers. <laughs> uh, all right. So this looks like a design tool that they would use to, um, uh, like if you're going through a dungeon and you don't want to fight every single mob, uh, you know, this gets you through areas without, you know, quickly. Uh, yeah, like some of these, yeah, some of these tools i can't imagine a gm would ever uh use yeah this looks like a design tool and we didn't have this on vanilla wow we just had a console that came down and you had to memorize your commands you know Uh and so this is this has a nice clean everything oh yeah you're talking about a programmer has polished this uh we this may have been a year after i don't think we had anything like this a year after shipping wow Okay. Yeah, it looks like it's so, from Wrath or, or above because it's a Death Knight there. So, yeah, like this, this is yeah. uh, this the Knight <laughs> Designer menu. Okay, so this is definitely not a a God tool uh, object. Uh, the God tool would very narrowly restrict you to what you are doing, uh, which is basically giving people back their loot, porting them. You didn't need God mode for that. I mean. <laughs> turning on and off area triggers and stuff like that. Yeah, the GMs, we didn't want them doing any of that stuff. But as far as the icons, um, these are probably just bringing up menus for one, for equipping your character with, um, uh, it probably brings up a nice little window 
for you to equip your character with spells, another one oh. to equip your character with items, uh, to equip your character with, you know, who knows, uh, faction changes. I don't see any buttons here for faction changes. So uh, different ways that you could very quickly test something. Uh, sometimes a bug would happen from one daily build to another where uh, you would have to create a new character. This takes a lot of the pain out of that process. Interesting. So. Thanks, John. Really cool. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it's time for you to plug away. So let's talk about all your projects that are going okay, to so, Yeah. Let's plug away. Actually, if you guys have any more questions listening to this, I'm going to be on uh, – Reddit uh, slash wow. It's going to be ask me anything about vanilla wow. Uh, awesome. uh, I'm going I'm to test the water in the Reddit board. So we'll see how long this happens. <laughs> see if the moderators can, uh, keep it clean. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to see. Uh, that's going to happen August 28th Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's New York time. Um, I'm going to be on r slash wow. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna be answering some questions. If you guys have any questions about classic uh, uh, vanilla WoW, um, I'll be uh, there. Yeah. So the WoW uh, Diaries ki is Kickstarter on August 28th, 2 p.m. Yes. Just repeating that. Yeah. So yeah. Hell yeah. If you guys uh, want to see this book come to fruition, and we have the first hundred or so pages, it's a very interesting read. Highly recommend going over there and helping John out to make this dream come true. Yeah, guys. Yep. Uh, and then term projects I've been working on a board game that translates boss fights and dungeon crawls into the tabletop. Uh, I don't like any dungeon crawl game that's out there. Uh, yeah. There's too many rules. They're too, too slow. They're just a ponderous experience. And there's this strange fetish with miniatures that have just uh, <laughs> uh, invaded the, the rightful space it belongs so uh, <laughs> hopefully i can uh i've been working on this thing for few years um i'm at the i'm also like building it up so it starts it the game is supposed to be like as soon as you walk in the room and you see the game you should know how to play it. so you could sit down pick up the dice roll the dice and you're, you're you're making decisions playing the game uh that's the vision for it it's kind of like magic the gathering where it incrementally builds up a uh, complexity um, I'm looking at a really short, hopefully, uh, rule book, uh, which is, uh, but having deep, uh, boss fights, that's, that's, that's the goal, you know? So, really cool. um, so that's my board game that I'm going to be doing. Uh, I moved out in Ohio and there are so many board game development groups out here. I, I had no idea. There's nothing like this in California. I, wow. I couldn't believe this in the middle of Ohio. Like, like wow, I was... I was gone for 27 years and they turned out into, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, developers. There's, there's restaurants and cafes that are dedicated to board games out here. And I, I awesome. never, never even thought about this. I've been, I, there's some of them I still have any money. So uh, yeah, I'm out here doing that and I'm writing a novel uh, and Ooh. it's a, uh, it's a modern day. Uh, I've been researching this <laughs> on this also for three years uh i've got 300 pages of research it's a modern day apocalyptic uh uh take on cthulhu uh oh, I, no. I i don't like uh, it, i don't like how a lot of cthulhu stories end with cthulhu rising and that's it that's that's uh, the end uh, because it's such a complicated mess how do you how to resolve C cthulhu with nuclear weapons or lasers or rail guns you know right the, the american armed forces are a resilient bunch. Okay. And so I've been researching medical, uh, how hospitals work, DNA research. I want Cthulhu to be scientifically based. Uh, I, I've been researching Jesse stuff, uh, uh, FEMA, MEMA, uh, emergency management systems, how the military reacts to dangers, uh, on, on, uh, American soil, uh, how the police station reacts, you know, to, to wow. national emergencies. So that's the story. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's a series of four books. I'm going to write them all at once. So, uh, um, uh, that's long-term we're that looking freaking awesome, man. many years. <laughs> yeah. Many years. I'm a big fan of Godzilla movie. American yeah. horror is so bad in the it's sense horrible. that the first, 
45 minutes, you're watching some asshole deny that werewolves exist. He doesn't believe <laughs> in ghosts. There's no such thing as Bigfoot or the Lockfoot monster. And the audience who has paid up front, they've bought into the fantasy. They're, or they're fans of monsters, okay? They've got to sit there. And it's it's insulting to the audience to, to follow these characters, the sheriff that doesn't believe what's going on. They don't have anything like that in Japan. If it's of a monster, there's a there's a governmental monster control and monster warning and you know a monster. Yeah, that's, that's true. What I love and and I want to have characters agree. that deal with this situation. I don't, don't like these guys. The characters don't interest me at all. So wow. um, that's another thing I'm going to be throwing into the mix. <laughs> Great. That's wow. what we get long term, very long. term yeah <laughs> i've also been working on a novel project for the last seven years but it's been it's been slow going <laughs> considering in graduate school oh yeah but if you have any um questions about dna or genetics that's what i specialize in so if you have any questions in that just send me some questions and i should be able to help you with that really yeah yeah oh dude yeah, yeah. i'm Mr. totally Genetics there over here. i'm all over you oh yeah. that is great yeah so if you just send me some okay. questions well, and I'll, I'll definitely... yeah that's interesting <laughs> my, my novel's a fantasy oh novel, my but, god yeah, yeah. So that's that's really cool, um, uh, John. I wish we can go on forever, but I uh, I know uh, <laughs> I uh, I'm gonna do some. Well, house- oh, yeah. you also have your uh, your uh, two. Uh, you said you have. Oh the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I have some promotions coming up. Okay, so on Twitter, I'm tweeting quotes from my book. Okay. Uh, I'll give a link to my Twitter so we don't have to do it. Uh, Wowhead, I'm gonna have a, a new article every uh, Monday, uh, starting this Monday on post wow development this is this is material that really didn't belong in the book the book ends with the launching of wow uh our disastrous launch okay <laughs> and uh why what it was like um to, to to launch wow uh and then i the articles deal with a lot of post uh wow stuff so i've got three or four articles coming down the pipe they're pretty hefty articles too uh nice. one of the articles is like i told you like the greatest uh, the 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 liner notes of all the dungeons um let's see uh i've got uh, a couple i think on reddit they posted wow reddit if you do a search um there's a uh, sample chapter uh and uh, icy veins i i have another pdf coming on icy veins about where we basically showed all our features on wow of wow and what the developers reaction uh were to uh to that news getting out you know all the other mmos so that's awesome yeah if you send us those links we'll be sure to tweet them out as well um yeah oh cool so just some brief housekeeping all, if you're watching on youtube all of the relevant links for john are underneath his face so his facebook page his twitter his website when it's ready.com <laughs> his kickstarter is on august 28th the link is in the description of the youtube channel if you're listening on a podcast head over to youtube and check out the links that are on the actual video uh Def Talk is available on iTunes. It's available on Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Um, so you know you have every every way of kind of, of listening to John's interview. This will be posted um, approximately a week after it's on YouTube. It'll be posted on the podcasting system, so it'll be on there maybe three days, actually three to four days. Um, and just make sure you give John your support uh, for the book, yeah. for the Wow Diary, and because uh, that really needs to come out. Uh, 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 we need to read that. We need to like kind of realize what's going on. <laughs> in the development process, because that'll give us a better idea of what's going on happen with Classic. So I think that's very important that we do that. Absolutely. Um, and uh, if just Def Camp Melderon housekeeping, we have a Patreon if you want to head over and support the channel. We're on Twitter as well and Discord. Uh, links are in the description. And if you want to be on Def Talk, email us at melderon.gaming at gmail.com. We don't care who you are. You don't have to be someone of John's stature. You could be just a normal player. So if you want to be on Def yeah. Talk, you can be on the show. Def John, Camp. thank yeah. you so much. I just want Thanks to say, guys, yeah, me. thank you so much, John. Uh, this was amazing. I, you were. Our, I'm sorry if we answered some questions that were a little like, whoa, what that? but oh, you were no, our first not person all. from no, Blizzard. No, no. So <laughs> you, you're gonna hang up and you're gonna go. Oh, we forgot to ask him this, or that, or the other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yes. real, real quick, I, I just want to say something that's probably on everyone's minds. John, thank you for being the person who you are. Because if it wasn't for you. We wouldn't have a lot of the experience we have in Classic WoW. You've literally made this adventure for us um, more believable, more enjoyable, 
and the immersion is really uh, a huge factor is because of you and and thank you for being the person you are and thank Absolutely. you for taking that leap leaving new york going to blizzard for that pay cut and doing what you did <laughs> seriously thank you john thank yeah. you thank you guys all right well until next time guys this is def camp melderon and our guest john On stats yeah so uh thanks guys all right guys thank Peace. you see ya